Juntas. Música de Reyes en Navarra. I'm just going to mute. Okay, right, are we, are we ready? Are we ready, Alex? Yep, all ready. All ready. Hello. Right, so has everybody um, been admitted that trying to get in? There's one. Yeah, one. there might be a few more to come, but I'll let them in if you want to make a start. Right, okay. Hello everybody and welcome. Um, I'm Fran Pitt and I'm a volunteer with Sheffield Community Contact Tracers and we've been working to support local people uh, throughout the pandemic. Today we've got, or this afternoon, we've got five exciting presentations lined up for you um, and it's all about the latest with COVID. Um, and these presentations have been produced by five third year medical students who have been working with us during the last four or five weeks. Each presentation is between 10 and 15 minutes uh, and there will be time for one or two questions after each presentation. Uh, and we'd like you to put those into the chat if you've got any questions and we will um, try, try, and, try and get to them. Um, the session will finish at about 5.30 p.m. Okay, uh, just a few housekeeping uh, before we, we, we start. Um, the session is being recorded, but don't worry, we, we're just recording the speakers. Um, but bear this in mind if you volunteer to speak. Um, and um, we are uh, putting everybody on mute. So if you want to speak, you, you, you will need to, to, to unmute yourself. Um, so um, without more ado, I am going to start the presentations. And the first presentation is Ben Whitelaw, who's going to talk about how animals have been involved um, in the in the in the pandemic and the, con and the and the causes of the pandemic. So over to you, Ben, please. Hi there. I'm just going to share my screen and then we'll get started. Can everyone see that? Okay. Oh, good. Yeah, that's right. Okay. All right, so hi, I'm Ben. Uh, I'm a medical student at the University of Sheffield, and I'm very glad to be talking all, to you all today. I'll be speaking a bit about our relationship with the environment and how it's relevant to the COVID-19 pandemic. Okay. Okay. So what's been covered? Well, we'll talk a bit about COVID-19 and um, how it may have come about. And then we'll have a look at zoonosis, which is a word I use to describe um, the transmission of viruses or other diseases from animals to humans. We'll have a look at other animals uh, that we know can catch the virus and how they might be able to pass it back to us. And then we'll look at how we can prevent future pandemics. So when we talk about the origin of COVID-19, two theories crop up, uh, each relating to horseshoe bats. If you're unfamiliar with the lab leak theory, I'll take you through it quickly. So there was an outbreak of coronavirus in China back in 2002. Uh, and in a hunt to track this down, um, the origin of this, sorry, the Wuhan Institute of Virology went out and eventually found similar viruses in Yunnan. Later, a few miners in a cave in Yunnan died of a strange pneumonia. And the Institute investigated and eventually found a strain of coronavirus, which we now know is 96% similar to COVID-19. The Institute continued to search for viruses and eventually COVID-19 broke out in the very city where the Institute is based, about 900 kilometers away from Yunnan. Uh, you can see why there's concern about a lab leak. There are a few reasons why uh, all this information doesn't necessarily mean there was a lab leak, though. Firstly, the sampling was a little biased towards the area of Yunnan. Uh, if the research, uh, or if the Institute had researched caves closer to Wuhan as intensively, they may have found similar viruses. Secondly, a 96% genetic similarity doesn't, uh, well, so it actually signifies about 40 years of differing evolution. 
uh, making it less likely to be related to COVID-19. A few other concerns people have about the Institute is the idea that they might have genetically engineered COVID-19 uh, intentionally. So it is actually common practice um, for institutes like this to engineer their viruses to make sure that they can be studied better in the samples that they, that they have. However, these often leave markers behind and um, there weren't any of these markers found in COVID-19. If there was a lab leak, uh, the evidence to me suggests that it would have most likely been um, picked up and spread outside the lab by the Institute uh, researchers uh, without any sampling taking place. The Institute does take precautions to prevent this, um, but perhaps there was an error here. So how can we resolve this conspiracy? Well, the Institute isn't fully cooperating with the World Health Organization, um, but there are reasons for this other than a conspiracy. Uh, even so, more data would be useful, not only for this theory, but for um, checking the market theory as well. So the market theory. Both this outbreak and the 2002 outbreak were tracked back to markets where wild animals were being sold. Here we see the word zoonosis again. So that's animal to human transmission of disease. So it has actually been estimated that roughly uh, three quarters of new infectious diseases have a zoonotic origin. Uh, so this uh, whole topic has major implications for our future as well. But after the 2002 pandemic, it was found that civet cats acted as intermediate species um, because bats, despite popular belief, aren't generally eaten in central China or sold in these markets. As for COVID-19, we know bats probably did start it, but we still aren't sure about what the intermediate species were, was, uh, though now we're quite confident it wasn't pangolins. Here's in part uh, why we don't know yet. After COVID-19 broke out, large portions of Hunan market in Wuhan began to shut down. And also before the pandemic, these markets were actually acting illegally as well. And this quickly changed when COVID-19 broke out. So by the time the World Health Organization came and investigated in early 2020, a lot of the evidence was gone. On top of this, if we gave the virus back to wild animals around the area of Wuhan, it may complicate the hunt down for the source. Thankfully, we have some insight into the market's practices um, from research carried out between 2017 and 20, uh, 2019, uh, which was published this year. So this paper actually originally set out to find a tick-borne viruses, uh, to find the source of these tick-borne viruses in Wuhan. Um, and they found in the markets, the animals had poor living conditions and a range of diseases that could pass to humans or zoonotic diseases. China actually has laws protecting certain animals from being sold in these markets. And the paper found that vague labels were given to the animals um, to avoid these laws. And also to circum, you know, to get around other laws, um, like the laws on quarantining animals, uh, which was set up originally to prevent zoonosis. So these wild animal markets are examples of human animal interfaces. Uh, interfaces are a place where humans and animals come into contact and have the potential to spread disease. These interfaces can be large or small, depending on the amount of animal contact. Uh, and there's some belief that they were elevated, or so the size of these interfaces was increased in 2019 due to, ironically, another virus, the African swine fever virus. This led to reduced pork supplies and may have increased the demand for wild animal meat, uh, increasing the wild animal interface, and then increasing the risk for zoonosis. So that's a brief summary, or very brief summary, of how COVID-19 may have come about. Uh, though we still know very little, it's kind of expected um, because it took about 10 years to get a good idea of where the 2002 coronavirus came from. So what other animals can be infected? Here I'm going to use red arrows uh, to indicate uh, animal to human transmission and white arrows to show human to animal transmission. So we start off with a white arrow uh, and as previously mentioned, this signifies the fact that we might be able to reinfect the animals that we suspect caused the virus also oh, caused the pandemic at least. So a bit closer to home, it's found that dogs and cats can get ill with the virus, so much so that the Center for Disease Control in America actually recommends protecting your pets if you get the virus so that they don't pass it to wild animals. Similarly, it's been shown we can infect large cats at zoos with the virus too. Soon after the pandemic started, we found that mink farms were reservoirs for COVID-19 um, and that they could actually infect, it, infect humans with it as well. Farmers were found to have caught the virus from their own mink, and this led to mass cullings in Europe and North America, 
uh, while also making the world question whether mink could have been the original source of the virus back in China. So there may be other animals that can get the virus or pass it back to humans. We actually only just found out that white-tailed deer can be naturally infected. A recent study found a third of the deer sampled in Iowa uh, had COVID-19 mRNA. And though this needs a lot further research, it does raise concerns that we could catch no COVID-19 back from the wild again. So why isn't there much evidence about animal to human transmission? Well, we mostly base our understanding of animal human transmission on cases uh, because it's unethical to set up a, a study where which requires that humans are infected with the virus um, for kind of obvious reasons. As far as cases go, we know that uh, farm animals don't tend to uh, get infected because we have such widespread contact with them, to be honest. Um, but we know that mink can pass it to humans because they have um, such widespread contact because they're commercially farmed. So it's all about the animal human interfaces again. It took a lot longer to find it in deer um, because the human deer interface uh, is a lot smaller, um, although we do hunt them regularly in America, especially. Um, so that, that's how we kind of figured it out. For the same reason, finding deer to human transmission, um, if possible, might take a long time. The exact same goes for other wild animal species, and it makes you wonder um, what animals were missing. So we're creating new reservoirs for COVID-19. The problem is that, it is that these reservoirs um, advance the virus's ability to mutate, and uh, this is done by providing the virus with new habitats. Uh, this can help spawn new variants of the virus uh, with increased transmissibility. And we may have actually seen this with the Omicron variant, though it's kind of fresh information. Um, there's kind of two theories about where Omicron may have come from. Um, uh, the, the theories can basically stem from the fact that uh, yeah, the Omicron variant has a lot of mutations that aren't present uh, in, the Delta, in the Delta variant, which was the most widely circulating variant of COVID-19. So the belief is that potentially a earlier variant had transmitted to animals and been kind of dormant in an animal reservoir for a while uh, and has come back to humans uh, because it has a lot of mutations that are beneficial uh, to its infectivity of, of um, rodents. Um, but this is all very kind of new and fresh and um, it needs a lot more kind of research. Anyway, so these um, reservoirs can also increase the severity of infection and have the potential to spawn brand new viruses as well. Um, by mixing and matching genes with other viruses. So we already see all this happening with influenza A virus and pigs and chickens. So what can we do? Uh, well, to, to prevent future pandemics, it would definitely help um, to make these interfaces smaller. Uh, we could try and make legislation to prevent transmission from the food we eat. Um, however, historically, these have done quite poorly as the quarantine legislation in China did, uh, like I previously mentioned. A good step would be uh, to stop factory farms like the one you see here. Um, this is easier said than done, however, as meat demand is so high. Um, to reduce this demand, uh, it would definitely help to introduce a more plant-based diet, which we already know has other health benefits. Another good step would be uh, to reduce habitat destruction, like that happening in the Amazon. Uh, this destruction brings humans closer to wild animals, raising the, interface, the size of the interface and risking zoonosis. So a lot of these things require individual action and legislation from the government, but they also need uh, more cooperation from between governments. The World Health Organization is working with the UN Food and Agriculture Organization and the Organization of Animal Health to adopt a One Health approach. This recognizes that each sector can benefit if they share information and resources. Together, they work to improve our understanding of zoonosis and antibiotic resistance. To help guide the government policy, while respecting each country's culture. Thank you for listening. Right, thank, thank you, Ben. That was, a, that was a great, great presentation. Um, I do have one question in, in the chat. If anybody's got any further questions, um, they can put them in the chat. We've got a few minutes for questions. The first question, Ben, is, is there any evidence that domestic animals, cats and dogs, etc., in the UK can be infected with COVID-19? Or can they act as a reservoir for that virus or indeed for other viruses? And, and does the COVID-19 virus possibly live in the lungs or guts of UK domestic animals? 
Uh, yeah, thank you for the question. Um, so regarding infect the actual infection of dogs and cats, uh, there is evidence showing that they can be infected. Uh, whether they get ill, um, there have been a few cases of them getting ill uh, with the virus and actually kind of yeah having bad kind of symptoms. However, generally compared to humans, they are a lot kind of, they, they receive and react to the virus a lot better. In terms of reservo reservoirs, that's an interesting question because um, for an animal reservoir to take place or to occur, uh, the animals either need to be very sociable with each other as deers are, uh, as wild deer are, uh, or they need to have a very low kind of immune response to the virus so that it can stay within them for a long time. Uh, and there hasn't really been any evidence to, to suggest that um, cats and dogs hoard the virus within them for a long time. Uh, and generally, uh, I, I mean, I need to look at this more, but uh, I don't think dogs are um, kind of considered sociable uh, animals enough to be reservoirs um, for the virus. Um, but it's a good question. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. That, that, that's great. Uh, and, and, and a good answer to the question. Okay. Um, could we turn to uh, presentation number two, which is Rowan Patel. And Rowan's going to talk about our black and ethnic, Asian and ethnic minority backgrounds impacted more by COVID-19. So over, over to you, uh, Merrin. Thanks, Ron. I'll just uh, share my screen now. Okay, can everyone see that? Yeah. So a yes, nice, cheers. Okay, so uh, hi, my name's Rohan Patel. I'm a third year medical student studying at the University of Sheffield. Uh, working together with Sheffield Community Contact Tracers, I've created a presentation entitled The Colour of COVID, which aims to explore some of the reasons as to why the COVID-19 pandemic has had such a disproportionate impact on black, Asian and minority ethnic members of our society. So throughout the presentation, I'll use the word BAME interchangeably with uh, black, Asian and minority ethnic groups, uh, just in the interest of time. So here's a brief outline of what will be talked about. So I'll give a brief introduction. I'll give some insight into sort of the scale of the problem. Uh, I'll explore some of the reasons for why there's a higher rate of infection, hospitalizations and, and death rate uh, amongst the BAME population. Then I'll give, give a brief conclusion and then uh, have time for answering any questions you may have. So, so although the pandemic has meant substantial challenges for everyone, it's important to note that studies overall suggest that BAME members of society have been hit the hardest with higher rates of infection, hospitalizations, and deaths compared to their Caucasian counterparts. This presentation will explore some of the reasons for the disparity in case of infection, hospitalizations, and deaths amongst this group. Okay, so we'll start off by giving some scale to the problem of the impact of COVID on minority ethnic groups compared with the white ethnic group. Um, so this bar chart indicates the COVID-19 diagnosis rate per 100,000 people grouped by ethnicity. So um, Public Health England collected data on the ethnicity of all the 139,086 total individuals in England who had tested positive for the coronavirus between the start of the pandemic and uh, the 13th of May 2020. So as you can see, there are almost three times more Black British people diagnosed with COVID than those from white British, uh, white ethnic backgrounds. So this has a snowball effect in the sense that it leads to a higher rate of hospitalizations and deaths, which is evident from the next slide. So this bar chart indicates how mortality rate involving COVID-19 varies by ethnic group. So along the Y axis, you can see the BAME death rate compared to the death rate of the white ethnicity. Um, so after fully adjusting for multiple different factors and, and confounding factors such as deprivation, and occupational exposure, just to name a few of them. Um, the rate of death related to COVID-19 remained over twice as high among black males compared to white males, as you can see here. So it's two times the rate uh, in black males compared to the white ethnic group. So why does this disparity in infections and deaths exist? So to explain this, it can help to look at the determinants of health. So the determinants of health are defined by the World Health Organization as a range of accepted factors that influence the health status of individuals or populations. So it's worth noting that there are more than just these on the slide. However, those listed on the slide are those which are stated in the literature to contribute significantly to this ethnic disparity that exists. 
So the first determinant of health we'll look at is the health education of ethnic minorities. So this being the ways in which the government has tried to encourage health behaviours such as vaccination and testing in uh, BAME groups. So we'll firstly talk about the education given to BAME groups regarding public health messaging. So the last two years have been a really confusing time for all of us with constantly changing guidelines, regulations and procedures that have been put in place. It can be really extreme. It can be really difficult to, to keep up with these. So for those of BAME communities, difficulty comprehending public health messages due to the use of medical jargon and lack of literacy skills can add to this confusion. So some examples can be seen here. So the use of phrases such as test and trace, um, as well as self-isolation, the terms that can be quite easily misunderstood. Um, so if the government really wants to encourage positive health behaviours, such as mask wearing and quarantining, clear, understandable language should be used along with simple imaging. So all of this, along with public health messages being actually translated into different local languages, should be adopted in order to overcome the language barrier that exists. So as you can see here, this is a better example of a public health message that's been given. Um, so it's been translated into a local language and it's used these simple images to sort of aid understanding. And the whole point of that is if more people from BAME groups can understand this information, it's more likely for them to comply with government recommendations, which will obviously lead to lower rates of infection amongst that group. So another area of health education is educating BAME groups on how to obtain a COVID-19 test. So there's always been significant international evidence of ethnic minorities having an uneven uptake of HIV testing, antenatal screening, and now COVID-19 self-testing. So um, results of a study that investigated BAME people's opinions on self-testing kits was published in the BMJ in May. And uh, responses overall indicated that BAME people felt testing kits were overcomplicated and hard to obtain, with the online testing application to actually obtain the test being too difficult for elderly and non-English speaking individuals. So it's especially important we make this process simple to ensure equal access to testing. So the final area of health education is educating minorities regarding vaccines and their possible side effects. So according to the ONS, the highest rate of vaccine uptake by ethnicity were in white British people, with over 92% of adults belonging to this group being vaccinated. So this is in comparison to only 70% of vaccinated black African people. According to a study published in the BMJ again, the two major reasons for vaccine hesitancy amongst minority groups were concerned about concerns about long-term effects on health uh, and also a general lack of trust in vaccines and the efficacy of vaccines as, as well. Okay, so just going back to this uh, spider diagram again, another one of the proposed reasons for the disparity in infections and deaths amongst, BAME pop, uh, amongst the BAME population are socioeconomic factors, such as occupation and uh, living conditions. So I'll just firstly touch on living conditions uh, of BAME group members and how it can impact their outcomes from COVID-19. So there are three socioeconomic reasons that partly explain this disparity. So BAME people are more likely to live in uh, urban areas where death rates are higher. They're more likely to live, uh, they're more likely to live in larger multi-generational households, which can encourage the spread of infection. And they're also less likely to have a private garden, which means they're more likely to socialize indoors, which can increase transmission as well. So another socioeconomic determinant that can cause increased infections is their occupation. So the Belong Network completed a study ranking uh, occupation by ethnic diversity. So that is the proportion of the workforce who are from a BAME background. So here are the jobs with the highest rankings. So the highest ethnic diversity is actually found in taxi drivers and chauffeurs, the second highest in dental practitioners, third highest in packers and, and fillers and, and things like that. Um, the fourth highest actually in medical practitioners and the fifth highest were process operatives in various different sectors. So the thing that all these jobs have in common is that they were all deemed key workers during the pandemic. All of the taxi drivers and dental and medical practitioners had to stay working in person during the pandemic. Uh, this inevitably led to a greater exposure amongst minority groups as they make up a larger proportion of these key worker workforces. So this pie chart indicates the percentage of NHS staff by ethnicity. 78% of the NHS staff belong to the white ethnic group, as indicated by the orange colour, 
and 22% belong to an ethnic minority is indicated by the blue and green. So in fact, early analysis showed that despite only 22% of the NHS workforce being from BAME backgrounds, this small group accounted for a whopping 63% of deaths amongst health and social care workers. Oh, try throw. There we go. So um, in a study conducted by the NHS Confederation in December 2020, multiple BAME NHS staff were interviewed and asked a set of questions. One of the questions being what their thinking was as to why more BAME people were dying on the front line. A few of their responses are detailed here. Some thought the mass didn't fit a non-standard European face, leaving them more vulnerable to infection. But others thought the reasons were as a result of bullying and harassment, in that if people felt unsafe or had incorrect PPE, they were more scared to come forward for fear of being bullied or labelled a troublemaker, which could possibly hinder sort of future career progression. Okay, and another determinant of health that can cause higher deaths from COVID amongst minorities is genetic factors. So these genetic factors include variations in the genes of an individual as well as a genetic predisposition to disease. So how did genes actually play a role? So there's two sort of schools of thought to this. So one side theorizes that there are certain genes that minority groups actually share that make them more susceptible to COVID-19 itself as a disease. However, on the other side, there's a widely accepted theory that agrees that there is a genetic component to conditions such as diabetes, asthma, things like that, that ethnic minorities are actually predisposed to, which can make people have a more severe form of, of the coronavirus. Right, so the final determinant of health that has contributed to the pandemic's disproportionate effect on BAME uh, people is racial inequalities. So namely structural and systemic racism. So there's many different types of racism, including structural and cultural, which have affected the ethnic disparities seen in the pandemic. Um, cultural racism can lead to healthcare practitioners potentially treating a different demographic uh, differently, sorry, treating certain demographics differently to, to others, leading to inefficient treatment. And um, structural racism may lead to sort of more widespread effects on the healthcare system as a, as a whole. Um, although we can't really quantify how much of an effect that's had, uh, we must make sure that we're aware that it exists and collaboratively we work towards finding ways to minimize this in the workplace. Okay, so just the last slide here. I thought it's quite, quite important to include this last slide because it's quite topical at the minute. So <clears throat> you may have seen in the news that the health secretary, Sajid Javid, has ordered a review on systemic racism and bias in medical devices. So this has come about largely due to a study in the New England Journal of Medicine that concluded pulse oximeters, a device used to measure blood oxygen, works less effectively in patients with darker skin. And this have may have led to many unnecessary deaths during the pandemic. So results from the study show that pulse oximeters measured oxygen saturation wrong three times more in black people than in white people. This inaccuracy has largely been put down to the fact that med medical devices were put together in white majority countries and have sort of limited research on minority groups. So this is something that that report uh, aims to sort of uh, understand and, and change. Okay, and uh, just to conclude, the COVID-19 pandemic has had a disproportionate impact on minority groups, primarily due to socioeconomic differences in comparison to white ethnic groups. However, there are many other factors to consider to fully comprehend the full cause of the disparity. Thank you for listening. I'll be happy to answer any questions you may have. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rowan. Um, as, as we've got a, a time for, 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 for some questions, um, I've got one question here in the chat, which I'll, I'll read out to you. Um, some people dispute that there are genetic differences between the white community and members of the Black, Asian, and minority ethnic communities. Can you outline any published evidence that you have uncovered that indicates that there are actual genetic differences that might make BAME community members more susceptible or vulnerable to viruses, such as the one that causes COVID-19? <laughs> okay, yeah, thank <laughs> That's you. That's a big for the question. question, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, I think the main reason that the public are, are thinking about this is there's been a few articles here and there in, in the Daily Mail and various different news uh, outlets uh, in the sense that uh, there's been 
variations in cells and genes in the cells that are lining the airway and um, things like that that can predispose people to getting sort of more severe COVID and contracting COVID. Um, so it's still quite early days in terms of this research. And um, the main theories at the minute is obviously variations in the genes and the cells lining the airway, as I've just said, and also um, different in the genes that uh, control for blood grouping um, and, and, and sort of enzymes involved in, uh, in the respiratory process and things. So yeah, that's, it is, there is some evidence for it. However, it's not enough to say that it is a definite cause. I think the main thing that we can conclude def definitively is that um, genes of ethnic minority groups make them more likely to get these other conditions, such as, like I said, asthma uh, and diabetes, mm -hmm. that can then exacerbate the effects of the coronavirus, leading to increased hospitalizations among these groups. So, yeah, that's, I think, the main theory at the minute. And the other one is, like, quite... Um, theoretical at the minute essentially yeah. so yeah thank you for the question you know, i've noticed that research is, is 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 just emerging on 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 some of this and uh, like you say it is i think it's more about the comorbidities um and, and susceptibility. exactly yeah yeah is 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 more okay well thank you very much rowan that that was an excellent presentation um we'll go on to, is there, are there any more questions um can't see any in the chat. Um, does anybody want to? Uh... Well, okay, we'll go on to number three uh, presentation, which is Joel John, who's going to tell you more about the theory with, with, with vaccinations. And I'd like to say thank you very much to Joel because he's uh, broadcasting from Kuala Lumpur where I think it's uh, about one o'clock in the morning. So over to you, Joel, and thanks for coming. You're welcome, Frank. So can everyone see that? Okay. Yeah. yeah, okay. yeah. okay. So hi, my name is Joel Jong, a tight medical student from University of Sheffield, working with the Sheffield COVID content dressing. And welcome to the conference. I'm going to talk about what have we learned about COVID vaccines. So I'm going to go through how we calculate effectiveness for vaccines, different types of vaccines in the market, comparing them according to the types and their effectiveness, and also touch on the latest publication about booster jabs. So first of all, I will talk about how we calculate effectiveness of vaccines. I'm going to take you through this lolly as it's a bit complicated. Before we begin, we need to know that this is a randomized possible control trial where participants are randomly assigned to groups where vaccines are given to one of the group and placebo are given to the other group. The number of participants in both groups are the same. In this case, it's 10,000. As we know that we have the same numbers of participants in both groups, we'll take the number of COVID cases in the vaccine group and divide it by the number of COVID cases in the placebo group to calculate the risk of infection in the vaccinated group. Then we'll take one and subtract it by the divided numbers to get the effectiveness of vaccines. In this case, it's 90%. Even though the calculation for effectiveness are the same, but the effectiveness for COVID vaccines will vary if the endpoint of effectiveness is different. There are several endpoints of effectiveness of vaccines. The endpoint of effectiveness are important and when we are studying the vaccines. As you can see, the endpoints start from uh, any confirmed COVID infection, symptomatic infections by any degree of severity to COVID-associated death. Most of the studies are published using symptomatic infections, which is the second one here, and also COVID-associated death, the last one, as the endpoints of calculating effectiveness of vaccines. On the right-hand side, I've included icons to signify the numbers of sample size available for studies. The further we go down the hierarchy, the larger is the trial we need to calculate the effectiveness, as the numbers of participants will be lesser. For example, if we want to do a trial to look at mortality rate of COVID, the trial needs to be 100 times larger than what we have now, or 100 times longer. This is because the endpoints of uh, COVID death, the participants who died are a lot lesser and we have a smaller sample size. Okay, so now we are going to look at different types of vaccines. 
on the left here, we have the COVID vaccines that are more commonly and currently used. I call it as a next generation vaccines. That consists of mRNA vaccines, for example, the Pfizer and Moderna, and also viral vector best, the AstraZeneca and Janssen. The mRNA vaccines contains the mRNA needed to make the spike protein of the virus. The viral vector best vaccines contain the genetic material of COVID and its place in a modified version of the different virus, the vector. On the right here, we have the vaccines from the classic manufacturing method consisting the live attenuated virus vaccines. The vaccines include live virus in it, inactivated virus vaccines, protein subunit, the spike protein of the virus. For inactivated virus vaccines, we have Sinovac and also Sinopharm, which have been recently approved by the UK government. These are the classical ways of manufacturing vaccines in the past, but surprisingly, the paradox is that in COVID pandemic, the next generation vaccines are more widely used and produced much earlier and faster than the classic ones. General public might be worried because the vaccines are produced much faster compared to the previous vaccine in the market. My colleague Jack will explain about it in the coming talk. As we now know the types of vaccines, let's compare the pros and cons of them. We'll first compare the pros and cons of the next generation vaccines. The mRNA vaccines are safe as there are no live virus are used in the development and it's flexible in producing multivalent vaccines. This is very important currently as there are different variants of virus coming out in the world. On the other hand, mRNA does require an ultra-core environment for storage. The viral vector based vaccines can be sold at a higher temperature, which is much easier for transport and storage and vaccination sites. It imitates the natural infections and it is highly safe that as there are years of proven experience in the genetic therapy field. But on the hindsight, it lacks effective in immunocompromised people, as most of them are previously been exposed to adenovirus. However, this can be overcome by using adenovirus that are usually not infecting human beings. For example, the AstraZeneca vaccines, which uses chimpanzee strain of virus for vector. We'll now look at the pros and cons of the classic vaccines. The live alternative virus and the inactivated virus vaccine here have similar, similar pros. They are easy and quick to manufacture, provides multivalent antigens, very important, and no adjuvants are required. However, the live attenuated virus are not suitable for immunocompromised as live virus are needed in the manufacturing process. And inactivated virus are less reactive than the live virus vaccines. For the protein vaccines, it's relatively safe as live virus are not included and it induces a strong immune responses. On the con side, the immunogenicity is specific to certain proteins and antigen. Besides that, adjuvants are often required in addition to the vaccines to increase its potency, and these adjuvants are sometimes causes allergic reactions. I'll explain a bit about adjuvants. So adjuvants is an ingredient used in some vaccines that help create a stronger immune response in people receiving the vaccine. For example, in seasonal flu vaccines, are adjuvant called, uh, called MF59, which contains squalene oil, are used in that seasonal, seasonal flu vaccines. So it kind of like increases the potency of the vaccine, so it's a lot easier to be accepted by the uh, people getting the vaccines. Now, okay, so let's look at the effectiveness of different types of vaccines. I've included the next generation and the classic vaccines in this table. And all the vaccines are UK approved except Novavax, the protein subunit vaccine. They are all randomized placebo controlled trial. And the study endpoints are also shown in, the, in this column here, mainly preventing symptomatic COVID-19 infection. On the first column, I have shown how they calculate the effectiveness of Pfizer vaccines using this method that we have discussed just now. There are eight participants in the vaccines group are, affected, are infected with COVID and 162 in the placebo groups presented with symptomatic COVID-19 illness. We take the number of COVID cases in each of the group and divide by the uh, source population. And it will take the, uh, the 
vaccine group and divide it by the placebo group. And we will use one and minus the divided number. Then we will get 95.1% as the effectiveness of Pfizer vaccine. All the other vaccines effectiveness are calculated using the same method here. As you can see, all the vaccines have a relatively high effectiveness in preventing symptomatic COVID infection. There are several side effects from vaccines, but most of them are mild. Among the common side effects, there are sore arm from injection, feeling tired after getting the vaccines, headache, muscle pain, and fever. There are also some very rare side effects, including allergic reactions, blood clotting, and myocarditis. I'm going to touch on about booster vaccines, which are the hot topic now in the world, especially in the UK. Based on an observational study, which is the earliest study in the world, of about 1 million people carried out in the Israel, the effectiveness of booster group is 90% in preventing symptomatic COVID. 19 infection as compared to the non-booster group. Up to that, 81.3% of UK population are double vaccinated and 41% of the populations have received their booster jabs. Even we see that the rate of double vaccination are high. There are differences demographically and hence not all area in the UK have a high vaccination rate. And this is determined by several factors that my colleague covered just now. Irrespective in where you are, we still have a very long way to go with booster jabs in the UK. In summary, vaccines are proved to be effective with all the trials carried out in the world. So the public are encouraged to take up the vaccines and also the booster jabs. Thank you very much. And that's all from me. Okay, thank you so much, Joel. It's um, really good to get that kind of uh, technique all the technology sort of uh, explained in, 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 in so clearly. I've got one question in, in the chat. Um, it's uh, despite the, the overwhelming evidence of the effectiveness and life-saving properties of the current COVID-19 vaccines, why do you think there's been such a growth in the anti-vaxxer movement and traction given to their unscientific and myth-based arguments? I think uh, this is a very good question, actually. So, yeah. there are, there, I think there's a lot of factors contributing to this uh, anti vaxxers movement. Uh, partly explained to by my colleague just now, there are the health determining factors, also maybe social economics, uh, maybe education background, or maybe media uh, appearance of the scientific behind the vaccine. Sometimes they explain in a different way or maybe a hard to understand way of how they calculate the effectiveness of vaccines, or maybe they enlarge the, the other side of maybe the side effects of the vaccine. So I think there are a lot of factors contributing to this uh, mm -hmm. anti vaxxers group. And also government and also other societies have been doing quite a lot of jobs in increasing and in boosting the rate of vaccines up Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think I mean it, it's it's a big question that isn't it really, and I think mm, yeah. a lot of it is is about um, trust and trust in the people that yeah. are telling people things, uh, and 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 there's quite a lot of reasons why people are either hesitant to take the vaccine or um, um, you know are, are vehemently um, anti-vaxxer from, from, yeah. from what we're told. There's another question here. Um, it, it it's become a a common phrase now that nobody is safe until everyone mm -hmm. is safe. And this relates to the poor distribution of vaccines through the developing world. Okay. Are, are there any cheap, easily distributed vaccines under development at the moment that look promising, particularly for, for poorer countries? So I have read news about uh, UK being one of the most uh, contributing countries to the COVAX mm -hmm. program that hosted by UN. Mm -hmm. So AstraZeneca has actually sent out their uh, how to make the vaccines to different countries, including like India, the Serum Institute of India, which produce the exact same vaccines by them. Mm -hmm. And also we have sending out 
uh, vaccines to the other world, to the poorer country. But giving up the patent and also helping giving up the methods of making vaccines might not be the solution for that because the poorer countries might not have the technology of manufacturing this vaccine because like mRNA vaccines are biovector best, which we have the now mm-hmm. currently the market, uh, a very new technology and not many people understand how to manufacture it. So yeah, so mm-hmm. we the, th- the things the government are doing right now are boosting up the production and also contributing uh, or selling it at a cheaper price or sending them to UN and they will distribute for them under mm-hmm. the program called COVAX. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. That, that yeah, it's there's there's an awful lot going on with the vaccines, mm. and 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 also as the new variants are coming about, we're we're likely to be needing new vaccines and tweaks to the vaccines as well, um, which we'll, we'll we'll probably see. So it is it is a developing field. But mm. thanks thanks, and and for me explaining how the effectiveness of vaccinations is calculated. That was that was good. Okay, um, over to presentation number four, um, which is Adrian Butzius, who's going to talk about uh, what treatments are there for COVID-19. Um, so over to you, Adrian. Thank you very much, Fran, and thank you to everyone for joining today. I'm just going to share my screen quickly, and I'll start. Okay, there we are. So, yes, my presentation today is for what the COVID, for the treatments for COVID-19 are. Um, just to quickly say, my name is Adrian again. I'm one of the 30 medical students as well. And I'm just part of with uh, the Sheffield Community Contact Traces to deliver this presentation. So in terms of uh, the outline for my presentation, first of all, I just want to make clear how viruses generally act within cells, how they infect cells, uh, the mechanism of that, so how it does it, and how and why viruses are so difficult to treat uh, then I'm going to go into the weaknesses in this whole pathway and what part of the pathway can be targeted um, as part of treatment. Then I want to go in terms of the preventative and hopefully the curative approaches for uh, treating both viral outbreaks and infections and pandemics. Uh, then I just want to go into some antiviral strategies because it's part of the hot topics of research right now, um, but not talking about this particular antiviral, which my colleague Jack will talk about after me. And last thing is just very quickly how to be better prepared for the future viral outbreak, outbreak and a pandemic. So in terms of how viruses act within cells very quickly, a general model. If we can imagine that this here is a cell in the body, any cell in the body, um, and this is a virus trying to infect the cell. And this here, this is the nucleus of the cell. So this is the factory of the cell that makes all the proteins. Um, if we can imagine this virus trying to get into the cell, for this generally to happen, there's um, a little bit of, of so material outside sticking outside of the virus and there's a receptor in, on the cell surface and once the contact is made this the virus can go into the cell and usually viruses have a little coat outside made of protein called a capsid um, and this coat has to come off the virus and once it does that then the genetic material that's inside the virus can be released and in, it um, that genetic material can be incorporated into the factory of the cell and by doing so, it makes more proteins and packages the virus back into its original form. And it gets released one way or another um, to infect other cells down the line. So um, why are virus is so difficult to treat then? Well, if you can imagine this is a cut off half of um, a little dot you make in a piece of paper, like a period, and you blow up next to it um, 75,000 times magnif- magnification with a microscope, then you can just just about to see um, bacteria and viruses. And there's some viruses that are even smaller than this. So that's one part of the problem is why, why viruses are so difficult to treat, because it's just so small. And if you don't know where the viruses are, then it's very difficult to know where to target your treatment. And more than that, these viruses are not only just so small, but they can replicate to thousands of copies. So when they go into the cell, they can replicate thousands, and they can infect more and more and more cells exponentially. So that's part of the other problem. It's difficult to sort of control that spread. And also, um, once they are reproducing and making more copies, they can mutate. So the genetic material can um, spontaneously change. And so it's more difficult to know what's going on to direct our treatments for that. And then also, um, any of the proteins the viruses make 
there aren't many of them. And also, there's just so little genetic material. Viruses are very small things. Um, so they don't have a lot of proteins that they do make. And so this makes it more difficult for us to target them. And if you look at between different groups of viruses, the sequences and the structures between them, so the genetic material, the proteins they make, can actually vary quite a bit in different classes. And this is also why it's very difficult to make a treatment or to design a treatment for all these at once. Um, so that's what I'm saying here. And also add to these a lack of reliable animal models for viruses and a lack of investment and drug development, these are all problems. And I'm also going to talk more about this later. So in terms of weaknesses in this whole pathway, what can we target? So if we look at this in more detail, here's the virus with its coat and its genetic material. Here's a receptor. The virus enters the cell and this whole process happens where there's uncoating, proteins made, and it gets reassembled. So in any part of this process, we can target drugs um, that can affect the process and affecting the process downstream of it. So just trying to reduce how much reproduction is happening in the virus. So in terms of an example of an antiviral very quickly, just to show you how this can be affected. Um, so I wanna give an example of one antiviral, this is acyclovir. It can be used for many different uh, types of viral infections, not COVID, but other types of infections. So here's um, herpes, this is around the mouth. So it can be given for that, it can be given for chickenpox, and it can also be given for shingles, amongst many other conditions. And the way this one affects this whole process, it affects the replication phase. I'm not gonna go into the detail of why, but it does do it. So just to give you an idea of how we can affect this whole process. Okay, let's take this off. So in terms of now just the general preventative approach for managing infections caused by viruses and pandemics, we're thinking of course of vaccines, which has already been spoken about in detail, microbe awareness and global surveillance and governmental policy. So in terms of vaccines, of course we know um, they can be extremely effective in the past and currently. Um, for example, smallpox was a horrific disease and flitted many, many people around the world in the 1700s and before. And um, it's actually been fully eradicated since 1980. So it's been a huge success. It, it was actually the first uh, condition that was that the virus uh, vaccines were developed against. Um, then we also think about polio, also very effective, measles, whooping cough, also COVID-19. We know that the amount of deaths caused by COVID-19 have dramatically decreased and many, many other conditions. So it's very effective measure, uh, method of preventing conditions caused by viruses. Um, in terms of microbe awareness, we're also thinking about uh, proper hand washing and sanitization, also shown to decrease spread quite, quite well. And then this part is all about what we call antibiotic or antimicrobial stewardship in medicine. So this is us using only antibiotics for bacterial infections and not antibiotics for viral infections. Um, so you shouldn't mix those two up, unless, of course, the virus causes a bacterial infection, which can happen, and then it is useful, but not just for the viral infection. It's important to make a distinction for antivirals. And then also, as we know, as my colleague Ben said, 75% of infectious diseases are caused by zoonotic or by animal uh, re re reservoirs. So this must be a very, very important point to make, to have contact between or caution for the contact. And also, if you feel like an infection is going on, it's better to get seen earlier than later, because usually once it gets worse, it's more difficult uh, for the infection to be taken care of. So in terms of global surveillance and governmental policies, we all know that social distancing and quarantine is one of the best ways, uh, most effective ways to reduce spread. And of course, there's a lot of governmental policies for that. And also, it's quite a hot topic right now. In terms of face coverings, um, of course, there's also becoming, they're gonna become mandated, I believe, slowly. Um, again, another very effective way, important to mention. And of course, COVID is considered a, a disease of international concern. Um, and so COVID and many other diseases should be reported so that we can monitor them. The way we monitor them, for example, is by rapid diagnostic methods. So of course, lateral flows, RNA testing. Um, and this is also a very, very important way to, to both prevent, to detect and contain these diseases, both in the countries on the origin and of points of entry. So in terms of a curative approach, or hopefully curative, we start to think of the community perspective and also the hospital, so the two different areas. So in terms of the curative approach for managing viral infections, we're thinking of planning the care. How, how sick is the patient? How sick is the person? Um, and if it, the person's not so sick, but we can think about supportive management, which I'm going to now, and also, of course, isolation or escalating to hospital. So in terms of just supportive management, if you're not very sick, if you have some symptoms like cough, 
Um, there are some advice for lying prone, so lying on your tummy can improve uh, breathing. Giving honey is actually uh, can, can reduce cough. And also things like codeine which is, and morphine, which are um, for pain relief, can also manage cough. So this is quite a, um, quite a strong treatment for cough. Um, also managing fever, you can drink lots of water, so fluids, uh, paracetamol and ibuprofen can also be very useful. And also breathlessness. So this is quite complex. You keep the room cool, breathing techniques, um, and air circulation to keep it a good flow of air circulation and oxygen therapy. So giving oxygen is um, also important if oxygen levels are low. Um, and of course, there's also things like anxiety and stress that can also be treated separately. So in terms of other conditions or other um, treatments, um, in the hospital, you can also give steroids outside of the hospital. But one example of these that give very often hospital is dex dexamethasone. It can be given as a tablet and as um, into the muscle intramuscularly. So what the way it does it, is, well, the way it helps, it dampens the immune system. So it decreases the inflammation that's inherent in infection, for example, in viral infection. And so by decreasing the, um, the inflammation, it decreases the damage to cells and tissues. Um, in hospital and actually in the community as well, we can give antivirals. I'll talk more about these soon. In the hospital specifically, there's a uh, different intravenous or into the venous system. We can give monoclonal antibodies. So this means it's specific to a, a particular type of what we call an antigen. So uh, for particular types of, uh, of um, viruses, and we can have different antibodies that are for example, directed against the spike protein of the SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID-19. And this is an example of it. In terms of a more severe, severely affected patient, um, they can be given a machine called CPAP. So this is part of the non-invasive respiratory support. And it's non-invasive because the patient is still breathing on their own, but they have the support of this machine, which puts air into the, uh, through this tube, into the mask and helps ventilate the lungs. And then of course, if the person's very sick, they can have a tracheostomy tube put in, which is when you have a cut into the air windpipe and you can put a tube to help support breathing and incubation where the person is just not, no longer breathing on their own and they have machines to do it for them. So what about um, some promising antiviral strategies? Um, if we look here, this is the same process as before for viral infection, but more specific for COVID, for the SARS-CoV-2. If you look here, this is the spike protein as part of the capsid. This is genetic material. And this is some of the receptors. So this is a very uh, well-studied receptor, the ACE2 receptor. And of course, it's the virus to go back into the cell and the same thing happens all the way through. So how can we target, or what sort of antiviral um, strategy do we have to target this whole process? Well, this is one, it's been widely used in hospitals, remdesivir. And what this does, it stops the, what we call the termination phase of the protein and then actually of the viruses, of the DNA as well. But it decreases the, the end part of, of these structures being made. And by doing so, it decreases the downstream effects. And there's another antiviral as well, which what it does is one causes mutagenesis happening uh, in the uh, GN DNA of the cell and the RNA rather in the virus. And what this does, it causes mutations to happen. And so it's difficult for the virus to, to form downstream steps. And it's worth noting that in any one of these uh, antivirals, or in fact, most antivirals, they exist before the pandemic happened and they've been repurposed for COVID. So this one was used for flu, influenza, <clears throat> and this one was used for Ebola and they've been repurposed for COVID. But what, if, what, what about a new antiviral strategy that's quite promising? Well, this one is called Paxlova. This is the trademark name. And it seems to be, uh, it's not very clear, but it seems to be a mix of two drugs. This is the, oh, this is the trademark name. This is the experimental name of the drug. And it seems to be mixed with this HIV drug, so drug used for HIV called Ritonavir. In terms of some pharmacology of this drug, it's not an exact molecule as ritonavir or the HIV drug because it's a combination of drugs, but it still seems to be in a familiar group. So we do sort of know how it works um, as the original HIV drug. But in this time, in this case, it's been used more purposefully for SARS-CoV-2. And the way this one works, it, it works in this step. So it stops the cutting of the cleavage, what we call the, um, the cutting up of the proteins. So if we can imagine, this is a good analogy to think about, if you have a big log, you're trying to get into the house through the door, let's say, um, if you don't cut up the log, you can't get into the house. And so by inhibiting the cutting up stage, what we call proteolysis, so the cutting up of proteins, if we inhibit this, the, um, 
the protein can't be packaged back up into the viral into the viral package and so can't be made and successfully released. Um, and importantly, Paxlovid can be used with other antivirals. Um, so this is called pharmacokinetic interaction. And it's taken as a pill, which is really good. And the reason why antivirals can be given in the community as well, quite easily. So in terms of more about this antiviral, what about some results from clinical trials in the press conference? Well, if we're thinking about the big number, the big um, headline figure, it's the 89% risk. So there's 89% reduction in risk of COVID-19 related hospitalization and death from any cause from COVID, example, compared to the placebo. So in medicine uh, science, we compare groups and the placebo have been given, for example, something without an active component. So let's say a sugar pill compared to those being given this antiviral. And actually there's results or there's um, um, scientific evidence today that was released that actually backs up this figure even further. And also the more soon from the onset of symptoms that you give this antiviral has been seen, the better the outcome for these patients. Com they've compared three days after a symptom start and five days after symptom start, and it's been comparing this. And it seems to be the three days is better than the five days. And also side effects are no different to the placebo, so the sugar pill, for example, and any side effect that did come up, so I'm calling nocebo, for example, were mild in intensity. Um, and the best part of this whole thing is that the trials have been stopped, actually, because this was unethical to keep giving the placebo group the non-active drug. Um, and just so it's just so efficacious, there's so much evidence for the, um, for the antiviral. But there's just a little bit of, of questions that still yet to be answered um, about cost and, distribu and distribution. So in terms of the cost, especially with these drugs that are given as combination therapies and are quite new and, um, and experimental, if these, th these drugs aren't cheap, which is very likely, it's unlikely it's going to be cheap, it's very likely for it to be very expensive. If it's not worth pennies, then it's very unlikely to give this to countries that make very little money or for people that make less than a dollar a day, for example. And in terms of distribution, if this is most likely going to be patents for this drug, if the patents, if the problem is with the patents and distribution, then they won't be able to um, give this antiviral, which is very promising to the rest of the world. Finally, very quickly, I know it's been going for a while, but um, how we can be better prepared for a future viral pandemic, we have to think about what went wrong this time around and how to better be prepared for the next one. So first of all, there was this lack of preparedness really from around the world because everyone was very surprised when um, the virus sort of started spreading. Um, and everyone sort of, sort of started uh, scrambling around uh, to treat, to try to, um, to, to cure the virus. So there's lack of preparedness in all these uh, systems. Even though epidemics and pandemics in the past have been caused by viruses that are very, very similar to, uh, to, to the, the virus that caused COVID-19. Um, and once these last epidemics or, pan or, or pandemics were taken under control, drug discovery efforts were just abandoned because there was no market for them, little infrastructure to keep them going. Um, however, had, them, had these efforts continued, then there would have been lack of antivirals on the shelf to have contained the epidemic, or the pandemic rather. So what about some solutions? Well, we think about things like, um, this is one good solution to have, it's called the joint pandemic preparedness ecosystem. So thinking about manufacturing distribution of drugs uh, with dedicated funding, However, um, scientists say that, that these ecosystems must be quite solidified before the momentum is lost. And they say that uh, once the pandemic is under control, we have a very small window period of around six months, where otherwise, if we don't take care of this, then momentum will just be completely lost. And also just identifying leading threats early, more difficult to say than done, but it seems to be the next pandemic could be caused by a coronavirus or influenza virus, given historical data and what we have now. But we also should be prepared for the unknown, so or viruses that we're not so clear on understanding. And again, a difficult uh, task to achieve, but this broadly active compound must be made where we can target more than one virus at one go, rather than just having specific antivirus, for example, or specific compounds, and just sort of filling the gaps with the more specific compounds. And finally, just prioritizing drug discovery in general so that we can have a large arsenal of antivirals <clears throat> and so, so we can be prepared of the different leading threats uh, once they emerge. So that's this quick bibliography of, every, of where I got the resources from. And thank you very much for everyone to listening for me. And um, if anyone has any questions, please can you ask them now. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you so much, Adrian. A, a, a really good 
canter through all the all the treatment and the options and Thank you. bring us up to date. Um, got a couple of questions here. Okay. Um, one is, uh, I think you, you, you raised you, you raised it with the antivirals um, that uh, they need to be given quite quickly in somebody's yes. disease. Um, mm -hmm. But there's a big problem uh, about doing that, I think, in the in the real world because people have to be diagnosed. And it takes a couple of days for the PCR test to come through uh, and all the rest of it, you know, mm. and, and it takes a while before people become, could become seriously ill and have to go into hospital. So what do you think about the, the, the chains of testing and vigilance leading to prescribing uh, that's quick enough for this to be effective in the real world? Yeah, that's absolutely a brilliant question. Thank you to have asked that question. Um, and it absolutely is a problem. Uh, so even though, of course, the better you get tested and you and you know you have the uh, the disease, the better or the faster you get seen, uh, the better. Um, of course, it's it's difficult to get it all done within a very small window period of just a few days, um, especially when the disease often is better before it gets worse. Uh, but of course, that's the reason why we're always. Uh, pushing forward if you have for example this slide I say about if you feel like you have any infection coming on it's best to get seen immediately and of course that's the reason why we have these rapid testing kits so that as early as possible but of course that's the reason why also there's different um, combinations of therapies we can give um, hopefully that could increase this period it's still early days for this type of treatment um, but hopefully that um, the time can increase because it's, it's absolutely a problem and I agree completely. Yeah. Okay, thank yeah. you very much. And, and, and one quick follow up, which um, I mean, what kind of ballpark are we thinking about for a course of one of these new antivirals uh, like Paxlovid? Uh, sorry, it's, it's okay for us. What do you mean by ballpark? Uh, oh right, sorry. Um, yeah, what what kind of figure are they? Are they one pound for a course or? or oh, <laughs> that's, the pro pounds? that's the problem. <laughs> that's the problem because uh, other new antivirals. Um, have been in the hundreds. So it's absolutely, mm. it's difficult. Um, if they're not in the pennies, like, oh, like I said, in the pennies or maybe dollar range, then it's very difficult to get this, this new drug Paxlova being sold worldwide. So there's no figures yet. And I'm really, really looking forward to hearing about them, but I hope that they're lower than in the hundreds. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you. Let's hope. Okay, thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, right, we're on to the um, last presentation, which is Jack Adams, who is actually going to talk a lot more about the um, miracle drug, uh, Molnupiravir. Uh, so over to you, Jack. Thank you very much. I will uh, share my screen. Okay, can we all see that? Yep, yep. Brilliant. Um, so, uh, <clears throat> yeah, mine's the uh, final of five presentations today, um, and they've all been brilliant, by the way. Um, so just to introduce myself, my name's Jack Adams. Um, I'm also a third year medical student, um, and I've also been working with the Sheffield Community Contact Tracers for the last five weeks. Um, nicely following on from Adrian's wonderful presentation, I'll be uh, talking about a specific new medication that a lot of you may have seen in the news quite a lot in recent months, I would say, um, called Molnupiravir. Um, so my presentation is going to aim to give a lot more information than what's actually been provided about what this drug is, but also importantly, um, what this drug is not. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, a lot of you will have seen uh, Molnupiravir mentioned in the news a lot in recent weeks and months. Um, Molnupiravir has readily been touted as the game changer for COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And here you can see all the headlines um, that the many news outlets have delivered. Um, upon approval of the drug initially, Health Secretary uh, Sajid David described the occasion as a historic day for our country. Um, and it was him who touted it as the game changer saying, um, most vulnerable and the immunosuppressed. So um, this presentation, I'm going to provide you with a lot more information about this. So um, just before I get into the, what the drug actually is, I just wanted to provide a bit of a timeline as to how we actually arrived at this new medication, just to put it into a little bit of context, really. Um, so what seems like a lifetime ago now, um, saw the first description of the uh, novel uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus, um, and that was in 41 patients from Wuhan, China, uh, back in all the way back in January 2020, all the way over here. 
um, with the World Health Organization declaring the COVID-19 pandemic in March 2020. Um, <clears throat> in that time, the UK has experienced three lockdowns, and I don't need to remind you all of that. Um, and also in that time, there's been various efforts to study potential medications and vaccines to combat the virus. Um, this has included the potential use of dexamethasone, which Adrian mentioned in his last presentation in June 2020, and also the use of um, arthritis medications in January 2021. The first vaccine was approved uh, back in December 2020, and the first NHS patient, 90-year-old uh, Margaret Keenan, was the first to receive it. And since then, um, antiviral medications have been investigated, such as um, favipiravir um, back in April. And that brings us to this new antiviral medication called monupiravir. Um, but just before I do get into it specifically, some people may ask, how do we keep getting these medications so quickly? And, um, and Joel alluded to me talking about this um, in his earlier presentation. So you may know that medications and vaccines undergo a battery of rigorous testing um, and various preclinical and clinical trials. And these typically last between 10 to 15 years. Um, and just to expand on these various phases a little bit more, preclinical trials um, occur before human testing begins. Um, often testing in laboratories and animals to determine their safety and an appropriate dose for human trials. Phase one trials are the first stage of testing in humans, which typically serve to determine the appropriate dose, um, usually in a small group of healthy volunteers. Um, phase two follows this, and this is a larger scale study um, to assess how well a drug works, with phase three trials being much larger scale um, trying to provide a definitive assessment of clinical effectiveness and how safe the drug in question might be. But in the emergency state of COVID-19, many of these lengthy processes um, were expedited um, and uh, there's multiple reasons for this. So this is it's, it's included um, a lot of previous research having already been conducted and also there being large scale collaborations um, and manufacturing. Um, there's been massive advances in science and technology, but also importantly, there's been massive amounts of funding, um, and this has removed a lot of the financial obstacles to allow a lot of these processes to all run in parallel. Um, so this has expedited, expedited the process, but all without compromising the safety of any new medication that comes to the fore. And here we are. So what is uh, what is monopiravir? What is this game changer supposedly be? Um, so. Back in October 2021, um, Merck, which is an American multinational pharmaceutical company, um, in collaboration with Ridge, Ridgeback Biotherapeutics, um, announced that it developed the, um, the first oral antiviral medication for the treatment of COVID-19, and the UK became the first country in the world to approve it. Um, Molnupiravir, um, which is actually named after the Hammer of Thor, and I'm going to butcher this for all you uh, uh, Marvel fans, Mjolnir. Um, I think it's pronounced, is a tablet which um, can be taken by mouth from home. So just how does it work? Well, Adrian's very nicely explained how viral replication works, but I'll, I'll give a, a very brief overview of it again. Um, when, the spike, um, when the spike proteins of the virus contact the receptor on the cell surface, I'll try and move it over here, um, the virus enters the cell, and then the viral genetic um, material is released into the cell, and utilizes some of the host cell machinery to produce viral proteins and viral enzymes over here. Um, and one of these enzymes allows the replication of the viral RNA. So we're looking at here. Um, and when combined with newly produced viral proteins, the new viruses are created and released. Um, and molnupiravir uh, acts by interfering with the job that this key enzyme does, introducing errors into the newly synthesized viral genetic material, and it renders it unusable. So we can see that in red just here. So who can take molnupiravir? Well, again, this hasn't been clear in, in the news, but actually it's only a subset of patients who will be able to take this. And this, these are patients who are not currently in hospital with COVID-19, who are deemed to have mild to moderate COVID-19, um, and who have at least one risk factor for developing much more serious complications of COVID-19, and, and that includes um, obesity, being older than uh, 60 years old, uh, if they've got diabetes, and also if they've got uh, heart disease as well. Okay. Um, 
So the approval of uh, molnupiravir by the MHRA was based upon results of a phase three clinical trial of molnupiravir, and that was released back um, in October, um, uh, beginning of October. Um, and the study was a randomized placebo-controlled double-blind clinical trial um, studying molnupiravir for the treatment of non-hospitalized patients with mild to moderate COVID-19. Um, with at least one risk factor for progression to more serious disease than that, th those I mentioned earlier. So if you can see on the left um, from this uh, Kaplan-Meier curve, um, where the uh, brown line represents molnupiravir and the green dotted line uh, represents a placebo, um, we can see that um, there is a, approximately a 50% reduction in the um, incidence of death or hospitalization with molnupiravir. And the table, which is in the top right, of the early interim results which were released um, shows that the reduction was 14.1% to 7.3%. And it was these results which led to the approval of the drug in the UK by the MR MHRA. So what exactly are the best uh, new uh, game-changing drug? Um, well, firstly, uh, molnupiravir reduces the risk of hospitalization or death across all the tested COVID-19 variants. And at the time that was gamma, delta and mu. Um, but Merck has since suggested that the drug is very likely to work against the Omicron variant as well. Although this, is, um, this requires uh, more specific investigation. Uh, molnupiravir is taken by mouth at home. So there's no injections required or specialist trained uh, healthcare professionals uh, required for this process. And phase one, phase two and phase three clinical trials of molnupiravir showed that um, it had a very promising safety profile. Um, highlighting that it'd be well tolerated in humans. Um, however, um, for many members of the public, that doesn't seem to be enough. Um, so I, I, I used Twitter to try and see how people have uh, reacted to this new medication. And there seems to be a very big divide between those who believe that this is um, this is a, a, a pro this is promising news, and um, those who are still very skeptical rather regarding the safety of this new drug. Um, which again may be in part due to the speed in which we're seeing this medication come to the market. But I covered this in a previous slide as to how this was not to the detriment of the safety of the medication in question. So what are the potential safety concerns of molnupiravir? Well, we saw from the Twitter reactions that many people still have concern about the potential effect of the drug on our own DNA. Um, but again, this still requires further investigation. However, as you can see in the top right hand corner in that box, Merck responded to these concerns saying that there'd been no evidence for the potential for molnupiravir to affect our own DNA. And they are very, very comfortable that the drug is going to be safe. Um, and this was also from two studies in rodents where there'd been no cause for concern regarding the effect on their DNA. And these, um, these rodents had received much higher concentrations of the drug and for much longer duration. Um, there's also a concern that molnupiravir um, has only been tested under clinical trial, uh, under trial conditions thus far, um, and we don't actually have any real world safety data yet, but this is true of any new drug that comes to market. Um, and finally, molnupiravir has not yet been trialed in pregnant women or children, so there's no data available to show whether there'd be any pregnancy or in the younger population. Um, and as such, the medication is not indicated for, for these people. Um, it is important at this stage to say exactly what the drug is not. And first and foremost, molnupiravir is not a replacement for the COVID-19 vaccine, and nor is it a replacement for um, proper and effective use of personal protective equipment, such as um, face masks and, and um, if you're in hospitals, gowns. Um, there is, um, there is a concern that the introduction of this new medication may lead to a rise in uh, vaccine uh, hesitancy within the population. Um, in addition, um, we actually don't know how well the medication will work in people who are already vaccinated, which now accounts for a very large proportion of the population. Um, so further investigation to this needs to be, needs to be done as well. And lastly, um, drug resistance is a very familiar issue. Um, so viral infections such as HIV and hepatitis C are treated as combination therapies. And this is something Adrian alluded to in his previous presentation as well. 
Um, so there's a lot more research required to monitor the development of drug resistance, especially in those um, patients with much weakened immune systems, um, as the effects as the infection may last a lot longer in these patients. So what do we know so far about how much this new drug costs? Um, excuse me. Um, well, the government have already purchased 480,000 courses of molnupiravir, um, but they've not actually disclosed how much the initial contract um, was worth. Um, it's estimated that a treatment course, um, so that's five days, um, is approximately 500 pounds. And based on the interim results, which were first released back in October, it would mean that you'd need to treat um, 14 people with molnupiravir to prevent one hospitalization or death. And that would cost approximately 7,000 pounds to do that. Um, Australia, Singapore and South Korea have all agreed to make um, purchases, um, including the US, but Merck have actually been accused of um, selling the drug to the US for approximately 40 times the production costs, which you can see in the um, top left hand corner. And that news, um, that news story is down in the independent in the bottom left hand corner. Um, and the contract uh, with the US was for 1.7 million courses, which was worth $1.2 billion, which for reference is about 20 times more expensive than um, Tamiflu cost in the UK, um, which was stockpiled for the um, influenza pandemic. Um, however, uh, those among you who have been following the uh, potential new game-changing drug may be aware that that was not the end of the story for molnupiravir. And um, on November 26th, nearly two months after the release of the, in, uh, the interim results, the final analysis was released and it came with quite disappointing um, um, news as to how effective the new drug actually is. Um, so in the final analysis of the phase three trial of molnupiravir, it demonstrated that molnupiravir actually reduces the risk of hospitalization or death by 30% rather than the 50% as originally released in the interim results. Um, so this um, shows that it's not as effective as when it was very, as when it was first hyped as the game changer. However, it is important to say that many still believe that if the Omicron variant, um, which is surging at the moment, has substantial immune evasiveness, molnupiravir could add um, a, a significant layer of defense. Um, having said that, upon release of the, uh, the final analysis, the FDA in the US still voted in favor of the approval of molnupiravir. And um, recently it was reported that Health uh, Secretary Sajid Javid, um, Sajid Javid is set to launch a uh, national pilot of the molnupiravir pill, which could be offered to, um, and is being offered to UK patients before Christmas um, as an attempt to protect the most vulnerable from the uh, Omicron surge. Um, so, um, now, just to conclude the uh, presentation, um, molnupiravir is an antiretroviral medication that can be taken uh, at home and by mouth and works to disrupt the replication of the SARS-CoV-2 virus in human cells. Um, it will be only be prescribed to a subset of non-hospitalized patients, and I don't think that's been said enough, um, um, who have mild to moderate COVID-19 symptoms, who have at least one risk factor for developing serious COVID-19 disease. And media and social media sensationalization dubbed molnupiravir the game changer based on the interim results which were released, but whether it is going to change any game is, it remains to be seen. Um, it is very important, however, to know whether this new drug will reduce the transmission of COVID-19, but categorically it's, it's not a substitute for the COVID-19 vaccine, it's not a substitute for a booster. And it's certainly not an, um, um, a replacement for effective use of, of masks. Um, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Jack. Really good um, finale to, to, to our five presentations. Um, there's a number of questions in the in in the chat, but I think you've you've, you've answered one of them as it came about. How much okay. does the course of molnupiravir actually cost? And uh, I think you gave that answer, but it was five hundred pounds, is it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The the, the other is, um, uh, I mean, I can remember the swine flu pandemic, <laughs> which was much much smaller than this one where vast stocks of Tamiflu were, were bought by the government and, 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 and stored. I mean, to what extent do you think this could or might happen with uh, uh, the antivirals, in particular molnupiravir? Because we, we do know that uh, it's been announced that Sajid Javid has, has, has bought up some 
a large number of stocks. And the question mm. is, is this public money going to be utilised or not? Well, I mean, it, I, I, I think it, the the trial, the at home trial that's currently taking place, and I think it's in about ten thousand patients. I may be wrong. I need to look at the number again. Will dictate on how well used this this medication is. But um, you mentioned before, like there there are so many additional costs to this to this mm -hmm. new drug that maybe people aren't considering, such as you know who because this drug has to be taken within five days of symptom onset. Um, and who 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 diagnoses mild to moderate COVID? Someone's got to come out and do that. Um, you also have to get there within five days. Um, and who is going to prescribe these medications? So, you know, it may well be a lot more than five hundred pounds. Mm -hmm. Of course, if you add in all the extra costs that are that are associated with it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So like you say, the proof's in the pudding, as it were, isn't it? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, well, I want to finish off. It's um, 25 past five. So I want to say absolutely thank you for such a brilliant set of uh, um, presentations uh, and lots coming in on the chat about how much people have appreciated. Um, and I, and I, th I think I want to say, because what underlies these presentations is a, is a vast amount of research to, to hone it down into quite a small 10 to 15 minute presentation. Uh, and, and so I do, do appreciate the amount of work that, that, that's gone into that. So I want to thank the five of you very, very, very much indeed. Um, and, and, and wish you all the best in, 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 your, in your future training and, and careers as well. I'd also like to um, thank Alex, Alex Cutts, who's um, been responsible for all the publicity, communications, website, behind the scene. And I see that she's put up um, on the screen for everybody to see uh, QR code and, and, and saying thanks for attending because this, this presentation has been recorded so you can tell your friends and family and everybody about it if they want to um, have a look and see and or if you want to go over some of the presentation again. So thanks so much to Alex. I also want to say thank you to Tom for, for, for organising, for uh, actually enrolling the medical students and, and, and who's behind um, uh, this, this webinar as, a, as, as an idea and, and getting all things going. And also my fellow tutors, uh, Kareen and, and, and Nick, Nick Payne. So thank you so, so much. And thank you all your audience, because without an audience, we wouldn't have a webinar. And so I want to thank everybody for attending. And lastly, to say to everybody, uh, have a very, very happy Christmas and, and hope to see people in the new year. So thank you again. And thanks, everybody.